so I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce myself and give just a few announcements. So my name is Bonnie Clefman, and I am and the new Associate College Consultant at Access College America. And I'm so very excited to be a consultant and also be a career development specialist. So I have my GCDF. And so I can not only help students with their college planning, but also help them figure out what they want to be and why they're going to college. So I'm super duper excited about my new role. Um, we have a couple of other awesome webinars coming up. And so I'm going to very quickly share a screen and show you just very briefly here. So if you go to, here we go, sharing this page. Do y'all see it? The, um, the Access College America website. We're going to go to services and attend a webinar. Can you see? Yeah. So um, to, here we are today, but we have one coming up next Tuesday that'll be really, really good. College prep in a post-COVID world. That's for all grade levels and all families. Um, that is next Tuesday, February 9th. Also for our, my Texas families, we have applying to the University of Texas at Austin. Now I have several families on here. I know they're not from Texas, but why should you attend this webinar anyway? It's because this webinar is for anybody who wants to apply to a highly selective college, which, which University of Texas Austin is. Um, we have another one coming up here uh, about award-winning winning essays, and there will be a repeat on uh, applying to the New University of Texas at Austin um, coming up again in March. So if you're unable to meet the, to do the other, then, um, you know, certainly join us again. So, Anyway, okay, so we now have a whole bunch of folks coming in. Okay, we have somebody um, from the Liberal, Ar Liberal Arts and Science Academy. That's awesome. Shadow Creek in Texas. Very good. Awesome. Um, so if you have questions throughout the webinar, first of all, I'm going to ask you to put it on, on view in the corner. Um, if you can put it on speaker view, so whomever is um, is speaking definitely will have the camera and um, for PowerPoint purposes, etc. As well, um, I am going to allow our speaker. Uh, if, oh, excuse me. If you have questions, I'm going to be monitoring the questions. So if you could please type your questions in the chat box, and I'll, I will make sure that Mary Jo is um, able to do that for you. So without further ado, we have Mary Jo Brandt, and she has, is coming to us from um, More Than a Teacher. And I'm going to let you talk just a moment about your background and also about your organization and how you help our students so much. So without further ado, um, here is Mary Jo. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Mary Jo Grant, and I have been working for more than a teacher um, for just over 13 years now. And so I saw a big change to the SAT. I saw that happen years and years ago. Um, and now I'm seeing some other big changes happening because of COVID, but also just because college admissions is changing. And I'll touch on some of that tonight. Our company is, um, we've been around since 1989 and we specialize in getting students ready for college, but really just this piece of standardized testing and admissions testing. And so, um, we love to see students, prepare for these tests, test with confidence, and um, it opens up the doors for scholarships and for opportunities at a college that might have been a reach for you to get you in. So it's it's a lot of fun. We love what we're doing. Um, we met Dale from Access College America, um, oh, just a little bit over a year ago, I think, and have developed a partnership with him where um, we're helping give out this kind of information. So part of what we do is running classroom programs, private tutoring, meeting with local schools, helping them build programs. But another part of what we do is give out information and information should be free and accessible is what we believe. So if you ever have any questions about testing, reach out to us, we're happy to help. Um, if you're one of our students and working with us, great. If not, you should still ask us because we talk about just this thing all day long and my friends and family are sick of hearing me talk about it. So if you have questions, reach out, we're happy to help. Um, we are recording the session for tonight. So just a little housekeeping. Um, if you do need to step away, don't worry, there will be a recording available. Um, or if you wanna share this information with a friend later on, you'll get that recording and you can go ahead and share it. Um, anything else before we jump in? Are we ready to get started? 
I don't see any um, any more questions or anything in the chat. Now I'm going to be typing relevant websites, and I put both of our organizations' websites in the chat, and that will be saved for you. Um, I'll have a few announcements at the end, um, but if you have any questions or comments at all, just put them in the chat, and I'll make sure that we we get them and get them voiced. So, all right, Mary Jo, take it away. All right, awesome. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. I have a couple slides we're going to run through, and then we are going to give you some time at the end to open up for Q&A. Um, and I think that's my favorite part of any presentation because you learn from other people's questions. Sometimes you're like, oh, I should have asked that. That's a great question. So don't be shy when the time comes for that. Um, there are some big changes that we've got to talk about, um, at least for the time being. So some of the things we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to um, talk about what score optional means. Every few years in college admission, there's kind of buzzwords. And I think right now, score optional is definitely, that's the buzz phrase um, that is oftentimes misunderstood. So we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about SAT versus ACT, how you can figure out which test you should be targeting, um, make some sense of the differences there for you. And we'll talk about how the timeline is a little bit adjusted for juniors and make sure you're on track. So I know we have some junior families here tonight, some sophomore families here. So don't worry, it's good information for both of you. You're in the right place. Um, and I will help you sort of plan accordingly based on what year you are. So starting with that, that buzz phrase of score optional, um, you gotta make sure that you understand what that really means. I was talking to a family yesterday and they told me, um, we're not sure if we should be preparing for the SAT or maybe we're just gonna apply score optional and don't have to worry about it. And that's not a terrible idea for some folks. There's a reason why it exists, but you need to make sure you understand what exactly that term means. So let me help you. Typically, colleges are gonna require an SAT or an ACT to let you in. It's the first part of that gate, right? Um, that The gate I talk about getting into college is your grades and your test scores. That's usually kind of the first thing that colleges are looking at. What's happening right now is many colleges are saying, we still care about your grades a lot, but maybe you weren't able to test because of COVID. There were cancellations for test centers in your area. So we're going to drop that score requirement. So you don't have to send your test scores. This is good news, right? This is a flexible, good thing that colleges are doing. However, um, sometimes what that means is that means we're not requiring you to send your scores, but if you send them, we're still going to look at them. So there are, there are three phrases. I'm going to help you understand those, and that might help you ask good questions when you're looking at um, colleges, ask good questions when you're talking to those admission reps. So score optional just means that there is no minimum score required. You should send your scores just if they help you, but there might be a minimum GPA requirement. So each college, like many things we talk about, when you ask us a question, we give you that awful it depends answer because it really does depend on the college that you're looking at. So for some colleges, they'll say you don't need to send those scores if your GPA is a blah, blah, blah or higher. Um, so you want to make sure that you understand that and that you ask that. Another phrase you might hear is test flexible. And so what test flexible means is that instead of saying, sending an SAT or ACT score, they might ask for something else like a CLEP test or an IB test, an AP test, something like that. So they still wanna see a standardized test, but they might not need to see an SAT or ACT. This is kind of like if you've ever um, gotten a passport or had to go to the DMV or DPS and you have to show identification and they give you that chart, that's all. You need to have two of these or one of these sort of like that, but for testing. Um, so test flexible schools will let you know which test you need to have. And then test blind is exactly what it sounds like. Test blind means they don't want to see them. Even if you send them, they're not going to look at them. And this unfortunately is what people think of when they hear score optional is they think it means test blind and it usually does not. So there are a few test blind schools in the country. Most of them were test blind way before this year. And they're going to continue being test blind. And the reason they're test blind is because they hate standardized tests. That's okay. They're doing a good job too. Um, but they don't like the test. They don't want to see them. So even if you have an awesome SAT score, they don't care. For any other school that isn't test blind, if you have an awesome SAT or ACT score, and I'll talk about in a little bit how you know whether or not it's an awesome score, then you do still want to go ahead and send it. That's the advice we're giving. I hope that matches up with what you guys are saying too. I think so. Um, go ahead and send your scores if they're going to help you. And we can help you figure out whether or not that's you. 
But for most of you, even though schools are going score optional, you're still going to want to take an SAT or ACT and get it over with. So you should still send your scores if you like them. If you don't send your scores, um, schools are going to use your GPA to evaluate your academic strength. Makes sense, right? You're going to be a student in college. They want to make sure you're a good student in high school. So they're going to look very, very closely at that. And that's all right. They're also looking very closely at extracurriculars and all of these things because they don't have that standardized test score to get the ball rolling. So that's not unusual to see. If you're not sure if your scores are good enough to send or not, then you should look up the average scores for the college you're applying to. And then if your scores are the same as those average scores or higher, go ahead and send them. If your scores are not, if they're lower than that average, now you have a goal to work towards in your preparation. Um, but that'll also, that may help you decide if you're like, you know, I've got a really strong GPA. I'm doing awesome in a lot of extracurriculars. This school is score optional and my test scores are actually a little, a lot lower than their average score. Should I hold off and just not send them? Maybe so. Maybe so. But you want to be asking good questions. We always say we start with the end in mind. Start with the end in mind of the college you want to be at so you'll know whether or not you ought to send those scores um, and you'll know whether or not it's going to be a good fit for you too based on how you match up. Your test scores, so they're not evil, they're not bad. We have feelings about them. The tests themselves don't have feelings. They should be an objective measure for you to show off your skills in ways that may not be apparent from your transcripts. And that's not just SAT or ACT, um, but it can be. There are other tests that I want to introduce you to a little bit um, I won't go too far down the rabbit hole, but if you have a special ability, right? I call it a student superpower. Let's say you are just a science whiz and you have always loved it. You love robotics, you love engineering, you're doing awesome in physics and you wanna show that off. You might consider taking a CLEP test to demonstrate that skill um, and get some college credit. So there are some other ways, um, some standardized tests that can help you if you have one of those student superpowers. Um, so they're not, they're not evil, they're not bad. We have feelings about them. The tests themselves don't have feeling. What I love about standardized tests is the standardized part. It's something you can prepare for and you can do better at. I have yet to meet a student who cannot improve. Um, I've yet to meet a student who cannot improve on these tests and getting a better score might help you to be a lot more competitive for the schools that you're hoping to get into. So are extracurricular activities weighing more now if you're not sending your scores? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Holistic review. This was another buzzword a few years ago. I saw this working its way in and now it's a little bit more commonplace, but holistic review means that colleges are looking at everything you submit. So they're looking, I think the grades are still the strongest determining factor. And again, it makes sense. You're going to be a student. They want to make sure that you can keep up with the caliber that that college is. So you're not going to find a school that says, we don't care about your grades. They all care about your grades, but you may find some schools that don't care as much about your scores. Without the scores, they're looking really closely at those essays that you guys are working on. If you attend that webinar and learn more about how to write a really great essay, um, they're going to look super closely at those. They're looking at your activities. They're looking at service that you're doing, rec letters. If you get those, um, they're going to look very closely at those things if you choose not to submit scores. Okay, moving away from from score optional. If we have questions about that, I'm happy to take some of those at the end too. Um, but moving away from score optional a little bit, I want to talk about SAT and ACT because this is where there are some myths and urban legends out there that I need to make right. Um, I've heard all kinds of things in the time I've been doing this. I had a family tell me, well, we're going to have our daughter take the ACT because, you know, she's a girl. Horrible advice, right? This is horrible advice. And another family say, well, we're going to have our son take the SAT because we're an SAT family. What is that? That's not a thing, right? You have flags, you put them out on test days, invite the neighbors over for like beanies and weenies. No, that's not a thing. So those ones are ridiculous. But one I've heard that doesn't sound as ridiculous, you may have believed, is if you like STEM, right, then you should take the ACT because it has a science section. And that can be a little misleading. So the main differences between the two, I'm going to go over. But when you hear SAT and ACT, I want you to start thinking Pepsi and Coke. Okay. These are two competing companies that do exactly the same thing. One is not the better test. One is not the easier test. If one was the easy test, you know what would happen? Everyone would just take that one. So that's not the case. These are just two competitors that do the same thing, Pepsi and Coke, right? So what we want you to do is we want you to take a practice test of both and you can print those out online. 
There are full versions of the test you can print out from online, or those of you who are local, if you wanna pick one up from one of our office, offices, we can give you one of those. Um, I can email you a link so you can take a practice test. Take that practice test and you can compare your scores apples to apples to see which one is the higher test for you. Some students right away perform better on one over the other. And most of you though, do about the same on both. So if that's you, we can talk about what you, what you do with that. Now, I'm gonna give you some of the big differences. They're listed out here. You don't need to read them line item by line item, but I'll give you what some of the big ones are. The scaling, scaling's really different. SAT, a perfect score, as you know, is a 1600. For the ACT, it's a 36. So that means if a student goes up 200 points on the SAT, we're like, yay, we want to throw you a party. We're so happy for you. That's the typical increase we see from the class is around 200 points. And so if you go up 200 points, we're very happy for you. On the ACT, though, if you go up two points, I still want to throw you a party because two points is a big deal on the ACT. Two out of 36 is a big deal. So two or three points on the ACT is huge. Um, SAT, it's a little bit different because of that scaling. Also interesting to note, SAT is a sum score test. So that means they add up how you do on your verbal side, the EBRW, and how you do on your math side. They sum those together for your total score out of 1600. ACT isn't a sum score test, it's average score. So there's four multiple choice sections on both tests. For SAT, it's um, evidence-based reading, which is what it sounds like. You read a passage, you answer questions. You guys have been doing this since like third grade. The passages have gotten longer, but it's still the same basic thing. You read a passage, you answer questions. Writing and language, which is not essay. Writing and language is grammar. So it's grammar and grammar rules. This of all the sections is the easiest one to improve. So if you wanna boost up your score, free tip, right? Work on that, it's gonna pull up your overall verbal score. Work on your grammar rules. Then there's a math with, co with calculator and a math no calculator. Those are the four sections of SAT. So half of your score is based on, I still call it the verbal side, but that's the EBRW, reading and writing. Half is the math. ACT, you've got four multiple choice sections. You've got reading, same like we said before, right? Read passages, you answer questions. There isn't, a, it's not called writing and language, it's called English, but it's grammar. It's a lot of the same rules that the SAT tests, the ACT also tests. Keep in mind, the tests are more alike than they are different. So there's a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram. You guys remember Venn diagrams from school, right? And the Venn diagram is a lot of overlap between SAT and ACT, right? So the English section is probably the most overlap you see. Then there's a math section, but you can use your calculator the whole time. And it's only worth how much, right? 25%. So math is worth 50% of your SAT score, 25% of your ACT score. That's interesting. And then you have a science section. And science section is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, I think they should rename that section charts and graphs and interpreting data because that's what you're doing. Be a bit of a mouthful. But that's essentially what you're doing on that section is you are looking at information about an experiment and then answering questions about that. Looking at a chart or graph and answering questions based on that. What that means is that means just because you love STEM, you may not love that science section. And I, every year we'll have a student who's an avid reader who performs incredibly well in the science section to their surprise because they're using those same skills that they use as an active reader. So it's a little tricky. So it's not as easy as just saying, well, if you're a girl, take this one. If you're you know, a Scorpio, take that one. It's not quite that easy, but it's easier than we make it if you do the practice test for both and then use a, con a good conversion chart. There's one we have available on our website. I'll send it over to you guys at the end. Um, use a good conversion chart so you can compare those scores apples to apples and make a smart choice about which one you're gonna take. Can you take both? Yes, you can take both. SAT and ACT, it's becoming more and more common, but it's not necessary. So if you know you're gonna perform better on one over the other, is it okay to just zero in on that one test? Absolutely it is. Colleges just want to see one good score. So having a good SAT and a good ACT score doesn't really give you an edge. They just want to see one good score. So put your energy, work work smart, not hard, right? Put your energy into preparing for the test you're going to get the best score on. If you're not sure which one, and the practice, then the practice test is about the same, which one did you like better or which one did you hate less? Or looking at the test dates is the other thing I would say. Um, 
So the tests are offered seven times each throughout the school year. Some schools are offering school day tests as well. I know in our area, a lot of the local districts have decided to offer school day SATs. I don't know if you're seeing the same thing in North and South Carolina, but it's becoming super popular. I love the school day tests because statistically students perform better on them because they're in an environment they're comfortable with. And I think it also has a lot to do with whether or not you're a morning person. Because on that Saturday morning, you're going to have to get up early to drive to your testing site. If it's your normal morning routine, you might be a little bit more comfortable at your own school doing that. The test dates I have listed here are the, these are the official test dates for this school year. Um, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry on my screen. I hope it's not too bad on yours, but it's a little bit blurry, but that's okay. You should get the idea. Um, and we also have the registration deadlines. He, these are deadlines. These are not suggestions. So piece of advice for you, if you're planning to sign up for any of these, if you're a junior and in your mind right now, you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to take that March test, but I haven't signed up yet. Get signed up because if you don't, someone else already is. Um, there are people who signed up for all of these back in August. So get signed up, not on the deadline. Get signed up as soon as you can, because there are a finite number of seats available. So once a test site fills up, you may not be able to take it at your home campus. So instead of taking it at Bowie, now you've got to drive to Wimberley, right? Or instead of being able to test um, at your home campus at Westwood, now you're getting up early in the morning and you are driving halfway across the state to get to a different test site because you waited too long. So don't put it off. Go ahead and register on time. And most students, most juniors will take the test at least twice as a junior. So two or three times is not unusual. Two and a half is the national average right now. You can't take it half a time. So that means two or three is really, really normal. So if you're a junior right now, I want you to start thinking, first question, SAT or ACT, which one's it going to be? Next question, looking at those test dates, when should I get signed up? Juniors, um, you should be testing this spring. There are summer and fall test dates, but I would not encourage you to wait until then um, because you're going to start running out of opportunities. And so I'd rather you get it, get it out of the way now if you can, get at least one test date in this spring, maybe one over the summer. You can work hard for both and be done with two. I don't think you need to take it three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Um, that gets a little cuckoo. I've seen it. I've seen some students do it. But what happens is between your first and second, you might go up a little bit. You're feeling really good about your progress. And then eventually you start plateauing out because you're over testing. If you're a sophomore, you're like, well, should I test now? Probably not. Probably not. It's very rare that I recommend sophomore testing. It's happened. Sometimes there's a student athlete or a student with some unusual circumstances that I do recommend they go ahead and test. But for most of you, hold up. The earliest you might want to test would be fall of your junior year um, or maybe late summer. If you like that August test date, sometimes I see a junior um, testing then and that's okay. But for most of you sophomores right now, what you should be doing is just planning, looking at these dates, starting to think about it. The dates for next year will be similar to this. So instead of it being um, October 3rd for the SAT, it might be October 5th right? But it's still going to follow that same pattern. What I don't think we'll see next year is see um, on the ACT, we have all of those dates in September and October. Why is that? Why did they do that this year? Because test sites were closed and left and right. And so they wanted to open up um, more test dates so that students would have more opportunities. So that's why that was. In terms of your preparation, as you're doing your family planning and looking at your calendar, you want your, your preparation should start about a month or a month and a half before your official test date. The only exception to that are high flying sophomores. And if I say that, and you're like, I hate tests, I hate school. You're probably not who I'm talking to. You're okay, I still love you, but you're probably not that high flying sophomore. The high flying sophomore I'm talking to is the student who took a PSAT this year, got super excited about it, is wondering about scholarship opportunities for next year. You've always done well on standardized tests. You wanna put some extra preparation in over the summer because you're hoping to earn a scholarship based on your PSAT scores. If that's you, you may wanna start over the summer, but for most students starting about a month or so from your official test date is perfect. And that means if you're taking the March SAT, when are you gonna be preparing? Now, <laughs> like right now, we have classes that are starting tomorrow, classes starting this weekend, leading right up to that March test date. The idea is you want your prep to be fresh in your brain, but you don't want it to, um, you don't wanna start so far out that it's not relevant to you anymore. And you kind of, it's old hat. 
You also can't cram. You cannot cram for this style of test. It doesn't work. Cramming in general is not great because if you know anything about neurology, you know that once you're nervous, everything gets flushed out of that short-term memory. So you want to start long enough that it's in your long-term memory. And usually that's about a month or so from your test date. Juniors, I already said, you're going to test at least twice. Uh, it takes about two weeks to get your scores back digitally for most of these test dates is what we're seeing. Um, and even in COVID times, we're seeing the, co the college board and ACT are pretty good about that. You should get your results pretty quickly so you can use them to plan for your second or third test sitting. Only exception are those school day tests I mentioned. They take a little bit longer um, because they have a little bit more bureaucracy they have to deal with. Final thing here, and then we're going to move on, is um, score choice. Score choice. Now, this is another mysterious phrase, kind of on the vocabulary test that I'm going to give you at the end. Is sort of, do we learn about score optional? Now we got to learn about score choice. What score choice means is you own your SAT and ACT scores. They belong to you. Um, so what will colleges see? Whatever you want them to see, because you own your scores. They're yours. That's, that's really score choice in a nutshell. It means you own your scores. P schools will only see them if you want them to. That being said, many schools like for you to send your scores every time you test. Why? Because it shows them that, they're, that you're interested, right? It demonstrates that interest. So many times we do recommend go ahead and you send your scores. Whenever you test, go ahead and send them. Some people don't recommend that. And if I say that, it makes you really nervous in your heart and you're just like, ah, what if I do bad? What if I have a bad test day? I don't want to send my scores. You don't have to. Why? Because you have score choice, because you own your scores. So if you want to wait and look at them and then send them, that's okay too. Um, that's totally okay too. But that's what score choice means um, when you start hearing that phrase. And again, ask good questions because you might find out that even though you were planning on waiting and just sending that one really good test day, now you find out that they want to see everything anyway. So <laughs> ask good questions. Make sure you're asking good questions when you're talking to those college reps. They would love to help you if they can. Hey, Mary Jo, I have a quick question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, a student asked, my school has an SAT on March 3rd, and then I'm registered for the official one on March 13th. Should I take both? Oh, I love this question. Good question. I think yes. I think yes, because here's the thing is that, especially if you're doing preparation, which you should be doing something, even if it's not with us, do something, right? Doing nothing is still a plan. It's just a very bad plan. So let's say you're doing something, you're getting ready and you test on March 3rd, and you have an awesome test day, that information is all fresh in your brain. So I want you to go ahead and take it again. If it, while it's fresh in your mind, go ahead. What if you could, if your teacher said, hey, we're gonna take our Spanish final, um, and I'm gonna give it on Friday, but then those of you who want to, you can also take it on Wednesday and see which one you get a better score on. And I'll let you have whatever better score you get. That's a cool opportunity you don't usually have. So to take them close together isn't a bad. Again, if I hear, if you hear me saying that and that makes you unhappy and stressed out, maybe that's not the plan for you. <laughs> so, but for most students um, that are asking that, I do encourage them, go ahead, do the one-two punch, get them close back to back. Um, but you might plan on doing it again one more time, maybe in May or June, once those results are in because you won't have the March 3rd results before you take that March 13th. So think of them as almost one test date in your brain. And then if you have one day, if one of those days you go in and you've, your allergies are killing you because Cedar's crazy right now, you know, and your allergies are just bothering you and you can't really focus. You know, you've got another one coming up, right? You know, you've got that other one in your back pocket. Um, so there's things outside of your control. You can't control everything, but control the variables that you can and one of those is registering on time for a test site that you're comfortable with. If your school isn't hosting, find somewhere that you have been before, maybe for a competition. Um, you know, maybe you have friends that go there, somewhere that you can still be a little bit familiar with. That's a great question though. And that's kind of the end of the big information I wanted to run through with you guys, but I would love to take some questions um, or if there's anything I taught, I went over too quickly and you're like, whoa, lady, I've got some questions about that. You're going to need to elaborate. I am happy to help with any of those. Um, oh, um, so again, it's kind of with cancellations. If you are, you're saying if you're registered and then you say, no, I don't want to take the test, you change your mind. They won't see that. Um, colleges generally will see what you want them to see. Um, so if you take an SAT and you get a bad score and you don't want them to see it, you don't have to send it unless you've automatically um, opted to do that. 
And if you have, let's say you go in on March 3rd or March 13th and you feel awesome. You're like, I nailed it. I did my more than a teacher class. I, I took a practice test. I'm feeling really good. I just did awesome. I wasn't going to send my score automatically, but now I want to, I want the world to know you can log in. You have a couple days buffer time that you can still log into your college board or ACT account and do that and select those four schools that you want to do that for. You're welcome. All right. I got one question here. Uh, another really good one. Um, can you send in separate SAT math and language scores if they are better on different test dates? And that was going to ask if you wanted to talk about super scoring a little bit. So yeah. how perfect. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, that's a great question, Leslie. Um, Super score is another one of those that'll be on the vocab quiz too, is what's a super score. So super score means they look at two test settings. One day you do good in math. One day you do good on verbal. They put them together. That's a super score. It is becoming more common. I think it's a little bit more common for SAT than it is for ACT, but there's still some schools that do it. A school may super score for scholarship opportunities, but not for general admission. Or they may super score for student athletes, but not for everybody else. So again, you've got to ask those good questions, but it's not unusual. And it's another reason why you probably do want to test multiple times if you can. Um, and it also makes you sound kind of smart when you're talking to the colleges and you're like, oh, well, quick question, do you super score? There is something just funny, fun tidbit that's called a super duper score. Have you ever heard of this? So super duper score is ridiculous. Um, a super duper score, they take your best SAT and your best ACT and they try to make some weird mashup and they call that a super duper score. It's a real thing, but it is really silly. And there's very few colleges that do that. Um, so don't worry about the super duper score as much. That's just a fun tidbit that you can impress your friends with. Um, but super score is very good to know about and a good thing to ask. All right. Um, question from Chris. My school has SAT on 324. Is that different than the official one on 313? Yes, it is. So that is a school day test. Um, sometimes the school or the district has paid for that test and you don't have to pay for it. Other times they're just hosting it and you still have to pay for it, but it is a separate administration. So if you like the idea of doing both of them close together, you may still want to go ahead and get signed up for that March test if you can, the March 13th one. Um, otherwise, I would look for you at, at probably May or June um, as your next time testing after that. Okay, very good. Another question. Does the, do the majority of colleges in the U.S. require an SAT, SAT, ACT score to be considered for admission? I know that you kind of covered that at the beginning, but this is a ever-changing kind of landscape here. So I'll let you address that one real quick. Yeah, so I would generally... My general answer is going to be yes, that I would say the majority of colleges will do require an SAT or ACT score. The but, um, which is kind of a big but, sorry, I said big but, but it's kind of a big but, is this year is weird. Um, 2020 was weird. 2021 is shaping up to also be weird. And many colleges are temporarily dropping that requirement. Just because they're dropping that requirement, though, does not mean they still will not look at your scores. Um, if you choose to send them. So that's just something that you're going to want to dig a little bit deeper at. Start by looking at your practice test scores. If you took the PSAT in October, you want to look at those scores and see how did you do? And is it comparable to students at the schools you want to go to? And if it is, go ahead and send them. Um, but I would still say the majority of U.S. schools, yes, are looking at that. Right now, though, it's a little bit bizarre. For class of 21, um, many, many colleges dropped that requirement. And yeah, you know what they saw is that applications were up. <laughs> a lot of students were applying and that was part of their goal. Um, so you may not have to send your scores, but for the most of, most of you, you're still going to probably want to. I hope that helps. Okay, one more question. For the science part of the ACT, do they test on specific subjects such as physics, chemistry, biology, or just general science? What a good question. That is a really good question. I would say it's much more general and I would say it's more of a scientific themed reading and data analysis section, um, which is more, probably not what you would have expected. When I first thought about that science section, I thought it was like label the parts of a cell or balance a physics equation and it's not. Um, and if you're wondering what that looks like, you can go to the ACT website and you can look at sample questions from the science section or you can download a full practice ACT and I would recommend do the whole thing and time yourself when you do it. If you don't have that in you, um, that's okay. I know I'm kind of nerdy and like standardized tests. Just do that science section. 
right? And it'll take some of that mystery away. Okay, good, good deal. Okay, so I have another question. Uh, how important is the essay component, the, so timely, of the ACT and SAT? Since it's optional, is it okay to skip the essay component? Oh, this is good. And this is one of the things that's changed. Um, and well, it's changed in general, and then it changed a lot recently. So what I used to say is if you hear something's optional, do it. Right? You want to be the person that does the optional thing. Leave no stone unturned. If it's optional, you want to be the one that does it. And I still feel that way about supplemental essays and a lot of optional things that are part of the process of applying to college. I don't feel that way about the optional essay anymore. And the reason is because I've read a lot of those optional essays and they are terrible. They're so bad, you guys. They are really, really bad. Because you're writing in a time constraint after you've taken a three-hour test. Is that your best work? It is not. And I'm not the only one who felt that way. In fact, colleges were seeing more and more. They're like, you know what? This isn't a good measure of how a student writes. I want to see how they write. I'm going to look at their admission essay. I don't need to look at this other thing. And more and more colleges started feeling that way and stopped looking at the optional essay altogether. Enough of that was happening that this year, recently, SAT got rid of the optional essay altogether. So it doesn't exist. So how important is it? It's so important, it's gone. That's how important it is. It's gone important. So you don't need to worry about it. ACT, they haven't made an announcement yet. I've been checking back. I haven't seen one yet, but I imagine they will be dropping their optional essay pretty soon as well. I love writing. Writing still matters, but the optional essay was just not a great measure of how students were writing, and it just turned into one more thing. Um, so they've gotten rid of it, and it was very expensive for them to hire people to grade those too. So um, usually there's a business side of these decisions as well, if you dig a little bit deeper. Absolutely. I used to tutor the, the um, language sections of the SAT and ACT, and it was always a huge stressor for the students to have to complete that essay. So, okay. For other questions, um, is ACT science similar to SAC, SAT science passages in the reading section? Yes, ish. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question question, but it's tough to answer. I would say it's similar, but not same. Again, there's going to be some overlap if we picture a Venn diagram with, there's a little bit of overlap, um, but SAT, a difference between the two, um, I would say is wording and word choice. SAT, it's almost like if any of you read Dickens, if you like classic literature, right? Dickens or Tolkien use a lot of words. Why say it with three words when you could say it with 17? And that's a little bit the SAT is a little bit that way. So their questions are wordier, even the math questions. And when I um, when I used to work with English language learners, they really struggled with that because they were like, this is a math question. Why do you have a paragraph here that I have to read? Um, and that's how the SAT works. So even in the scientific theme passages, um, you still see a ton, it's pretty wordy. ACT, in my experience, ACT is just much more straightforward. So if they want to ask you a question, they just come right out and ask it. And you can find the answer in the passage and match it back up. And that doesn't make it easier. It just makes it more straightforward. Some students respond very well to that format. Um, so I hope that helps. Okay, another question. What is happening with ACT individual section tests? Will students be able to take only math section on only, only on given test dates? Uh, I love this question too. You guys are so smart. These are thinking questions. Like this is just your dream group. Um, I wish I could see you all in person right now, but I can't, but I can still answer this question. Um, so this is a great question. This is something that ACT announced they were going to begin doing in September of 2020. So they said, we are going to start allowing people to retake just one section. So if you bombed that, that weird science section, you want to go back and you don't want to take the whole thing. You just want to take science. You can. And it's a great idea. It was going to be a huge moneymaker for ACT, but just like everything else, got turned upside down because COVID happened. And what ACT found is that logistically, it didn't make sense when you're having trouble keeping a test site open, when you're having trouble getting any juniors in to take even just one test. 50% of the test dates were canceled last year, guys. 50% of them were canceled. So when that happened, they can't say, well, yeah, but you can come in and just do the science section. They just logistically couldn't make it work. So it hasn't been a reality yet. I think it will. I think it will be a reality, but it really hasn't been yet just because logistically the seats are prioritized for students who are taking all four sections. Um, and that's what we've seen kind of how it's worked out. The other thing I would 
kind of the other note bene on top of that is just make sure you know for the colleges you're applying to that they will super score. Because if they won't super score, it won't do you any good to have that one good math section score. Um, what I think it will be most helpful for is for um, students who are hoping to receive scholarships. I think that it will help with that scholarship pool. Um, so it's, that's a great question and something I think it's good to continue asking about and learning about. But for right now, for, if you're a junior asking that question, I would say, I don't know if you're going to see that in your reality. If you're a sophomore, I think you might. Well, I don't know. We got to keep checking back because it's changing really fast all the time. All right. I have some, I have so many good questions. Um, is it true that some SATs will be online, online this year? Oh, that's another, that's another, um, it's, I won't call it a rumor, but I would say it's something that um, College Board is hinting at. Um, but it went from a promise to now we're just kind of hint to no, we're definitely not doing that. And now they're hinting at it. So if you read all the press releases from College Board, at first they were saying, um, we're, we have to close test sites, but we're going to have this online auction. And then AP testing, some of that was done online. And I don't know if you, any of you were a part of that um, last spring. If you were, you may have run into some issues. There were a lot of headaches with it. So they didn't have the kinks worked out. So at that time, right after the AP test, then College Board announced, never mind, we wanted to do a virtual option. We just can't make it work. And now when they got rid of the subject tests and when they got rid of the optional essay, they also announced in that same release, they're working on a virtual option again. What that doesn't say to me is that doesn't give me a fixed target. They're not saying virtual testing will be available in June. They're not even saying virtual testing will be available in summer or in 2021. So I think they are working towards that. I just don't know when it's going to be a reality. And I would plan for the things that you know instead of planning for the speculation. And that's hard. As parents, I see us do it. We do it all the time as parents. You plan for the like, you know what would be great? And that's what you go ahead and set your mind on instead of saying, you know, what's the reality? The reality is that right now testing centers are still closing. Students are having to wear a mask the whole time they test. And so that's the reality. So that means if you're preparing, what should you be preparing for? Preparing for signing up, but knowing your test center might be closed and be ready to be resilient if it is, and be prepared to be in your mask testing the whole time, socially distanced, because that's more likely the reality. Um, that being said, when virtual testing starts, I am going to be so excited. I think they need to make that move happen, find a way to make it work. I just don't know if that's going to be in the near future or in the distant future when we're in flying cars. Okay. Awesome. Um, uh, so we all know now that these subject area tests are indeed done, gone. Okay. Yeah. I had a question about that. I think I thought I uh, read that um, like a week or so ago, but yeah, that was new news as well. Um, another question. Um, Chris asks, do all SAT questions count or are some experimental for potential use on future SATs? That's a good question. And I, I wonder if you had maybe a um, maybe if you're remembering when we took it or if you had an older student who maybe already took it because there used to be an, an experimental section. And PSAT, they'll still do that. They'll still throw in some experimental stuff at you. SAT though, they're not doing that as much anymore. They, <laughs> they got a lot of bad press about that. Um, people were not happy with it. So when I first started with More Than a Teacher, there was an entire section that was just experimental. How mean, right? How mean, this is a serious test and you're gonna make 25 minutes of it just, just for giggles? Like, no way. So they've gotten rid of that. Um, occasionally what I have seen happen is there will be a question they try out and then they're like, Ooh, that was a bad idea. That didn't go over well. Our graders pushed back. We had families push back and contest. And so occasionally there'll be a question that they get rid of. And you'll see that when you're looking at your score report, um, it'll show that it just didn't count. And you're like, what did that mean? And that meant they decided to toss out that question. It's not very common, but it can still happen. Okay, very good. Um, another attendee asked, do colleges see PSAT 10 or PSAT test scores? That is a good question. So we talked about score choice, right? And remember what score choice means. Score choice means you own your SAT and ACT scores. They are yours. PSAT scores, and just like brace yourself if this, if this kind of thing makes you feel icky. You don't actually own your PSAT scores. They are shared. And they are shared with a lot of people. They're shared with companies for scholarship purposes. They're shared with a lot of colleges. However, this is for marketing purposes 
and for scholarship purposes, not for admission purposes. So the admission team that's looking for you, that's hoping that you're going to come on at UT, or they're hoping that you're going to join them at William and Mary, right? They are looking for your SAT and ACT scores. They are not looking at your PSAT scores. Even if the college might have access to those, they're not looking at that, that's a separate team. The people who are looking at those PSAT scores is the marketing team for that college. And what they're doing is they're saying, hey, looks like Shelly got a 1090, that's a pretty good score. We're gonna send out some information to her. Some of you, your mailboxes have been spammed because you got good scores. That's what those are used for. So they are not looking at PSAT 10, they are not looking at PSAT and MSQT. Um, they would love to see if you're a National Merit Scholar, which is a whole nother rabbit hole, and that could be a webinar in and of itself. Um, they will look to see that, but those scores themselves, the key part of the PSAT means that it's preliminary or practice. So it really is just practice for you, for that SAT or ACT. And you own those scores, you'll decide if they get to see them. I hope that was kind of a long way around a short block, but I hope that answers that question. No, that was that was really good. Thank you for answering. Um, we are caught up with our Q&A at this time. Um, yeah, so if anyone else has any more things they'd like to bring up or interesting questions for Mary Jo, please let us know. These were wonderful questions. You guys are so good. I love you. I think you're great. <laughs> yes, and this webinar is recorded. So, um, you know, I, I couldn't probably type fast enough to type all the answers into the chat box. Um, so I didn't even want to try with all the typos that would happen, but that we, you will have access to this, um, this webinar. So if you, if you missed one of the two of the answers or you had to step away, it's, it's here for you. This is oh, a good question about PSAT as a baseline. Okay, if you attend, if, if you have attended more than a teacher classes in the past, mm -hmm. can you come again? Absolutely. So the way our program works is um, it's like a club membership. Once you take one class, you can return to future classes for free for as long as you need to. And the reason we do that is because we like you and we want you to get great scores. And we know that you're going to take it at least two or three times. So if you do a class leading up to that March test, you get your results back from March. You're like, awesome. I did so much better in my writing and language section. Could still use some work on my math. You can come back, sit in on the classes all over again, or just sit in on the math classes again. If you want to, you have that flexibility. Um, so that is something we allow you to do. The only thing you would have to pay extra for is one-on-one -on -one tutoring if you decided you wanted to do that to kind of augment your class, or if you decide to switch tests, which we don't recommend for everybody, but if you started with SAT and then you switch over to ACT, it's a separate program. Okay, um, one other question. Is a PSAT good enough to baseline your score, or should my sophomore take an SAT to see where he stands? I think PSAT is a good baseline. I really do. Um, and I look at so many scores. I look at a lot of scores with students. And usually what I see is their PSAT is a good measure of how they would have done on an SAT if they took it that same day. The only exceptions are when I have a student who says, um, well, I'm I did attend that PSAT, but I was just guessing. I, I didn't think it counted for anything. I didn't really try. And I'm like, thank you for your honesty. You're going to have to take a practice test. Or, um, you know, maybe there was something else going on academically at that time. Um, so if you, you'll know if that's you. If when I'm saying this, you're like, yeah, that's kind of me. Then go ahead and take a practice test. It's not going to hurt you to invest the three hours to do it. But for most students, when I look at their PSAT scores, I would give it within about a 20 point margin of error for how well they would have done on an SAT if they took it the same day. Okay, um, when is the last time you can take ACT and send to a college? After your application is submitted, before? That is a, another really great question. Um, and it's that awful answer, it depends. So many colleges will publicize that and they'll let you know, this is the date for your application. And when you first send your application, you have an ACT score that you've sent, but you're planning to test again and you wanna do even better. And so you send again a later test score. Is that okay to do? Yeah, for most schools, that's great to do. But some schools will say, you can do that up until October or up until December of your senior year. Then we don't wanna see it anymore. We need things to be processed and move along. Other colleges will let you continue doing that. Um, we saw student testing all the way through spring of senior year for scholarships. So it wasn't for admission at that point. Um, and this happened, some of you may remember it if you had older students go through it um, a few years ago, Baylor, one of the schools here in Texas and Waco, 
Baylor said, we want to rebrand and we want some really smart kids, right? We want some really high scoring, high academically achieving students. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell you, hey, you're in, right? You're accepted, you're in. But if you test again and you bring your ACT score up another point or another two points, we're going to give you an additional scholarship to the tune of like $14,000. So if you hear that from a college, what do you do? you test again. <laughs> you keep testing and hoping to get that up with some preparation because that is the best hourly rate you're probably ever going to have in your life. So you want to go ahead and do it. Um, I would say though, as the general rule, yeah, Stephanie, that's a good question. What's the general rule? Should we be done by the start of senior year? Yes. Not, not just for college deadline purposes, but for mental health purposes. I would encourage you get it done get it over and done with junior year if you can. So that way, senior year, you're still going to be working. You're, but you're going to be working on finishing up your essays. You're going to be working on submitting those applications. You're going to be trying to like herd cats to get rec letters. You have things you're going to be doing. You're going to be busy. Get the testing piece done. And there are some summer test dates now. So you can take advantage of those. If you're like, maybe one more time, let your one more time be over the summer. And then if you, unless it's for scholarship purposes, I would love to see you be done by the beginning of senior year. Right, I think we're caught up with our questions for now. Um, does anyone else in the audience? Oh, Stephanie says thank you. Um, in the audience, have um, you know in our in our group today have a question? Give it a, just a second. It's a lot of information to absorb. It is, and it's kind of. Um, drinking water from a fire hose, right? It's a lot of stuff and you're not sure what's important and what's relevant for you. So give yourself some time, think about it, let it digest, look at the test dates, talk about it as a family, you know, reach out, get some help when you need it. And if there is something you find later on and you do have any questions, I am gonna give you guys um, the email address for my company so that you can email us. Excellent. So you can email us at info at more than a teacher.com. That just goes to everybody. Or if you want to just email me um, because you're like, you know what you talked about. I have a question just for you. Then it's, um, it's really easy. It's just Mary Jo at more than a teacher.com. So feel free, reach out anytime. Um, information should be helpful. So when do they post the dates for late 2021? They're already posted um, for spring of 2021. Now going into the fall, if you look college board and ACT do it a little bit differently, ACT has it posted and they're like, these are the dates. This is when it's gonna be. College board, um, usually they'll say these are the anticipated dates. So you have to go to the official test makers sites to double check on that. Um, usually the new dates are released officially though in the summer. So sometime in July and August is usually when you see the next round of dates being released. Excellent. Any other questions? Such good ones today. Okay. Okay, really good. Um, and um, to be clear, you and your company can work with students remotely as well. Absolutely. So we are doing virtual classes and private tutoring, in per small group in-person classes and private tutoring as well. So whatever your need is, um, really, if you wanna do something really comprehensive, you wanna go um, get started over the summer, you're a sophomore right now, you wanna do something really, really in depth, we can help you. If you're a junior and you're like, you know what, I've got a pretty good score, I just wanna work on these couple problem areas. Can you do that? We can do that too. So reach out if you want to do a consultation. If you don't already work with us, we do free score consultations where we just look at your scores, talk about your goals. And it usually takes about 30 minutes, never a charge for that. And we are happy to do it um, if you need help deciding what your next step should be. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. This was a very, very informative webinar. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to end with just a few um, housekeeping items as well. And another reminder to sign up for um, our Access College America. I'm going to share share our screen and share just a few more web resources with everybody. So here we go. Okay. So if you would like to schedule a consultation for um, services with Access College America, and this is just general college planning, you can go to our website and right here say schedule consultation, 
and you are going to click that, book a strategy session, and then just choose consultation request. It's 30 minutes, it's free, um, and you, you can kind of talk to Dale or myself about some of the other things that, um, that our company can do for you besides these awesome free webinars that are free and open to anybody all over the place. We're so glad to provide this information for you. As well, one thing I don't think I, um, I pointed out before was our archived webinars. So if, you, if there's a topic that you're interested in, but you've not, um, you didn't have the time or just missed out and, or didn't know about our company, please, please, please come over here. Here's a, a recording of applying to, the, to UT Austin, um, applying for financial aid. That's a really, really good and necessary one, especially for um, my juniors and seniors, college prep in the post-COVID world, and test optional, another review of what we just talked about a little bit today. So yeah, virtual college research, most of our research right now is going on online. Um, as Mary Jo mentioned, college applications have gone way, way up through the roof. That's one of the reasons is because our um, students can go just about anywhere from the comfort of their own living room or bedroom. We can check out colleges. We can see what it's all about without even, um, you know, setting foot outside our home. And so that's definitely driven applications up because folks feel like they can be there and see and sample all the different places. So um, if you are interested how to visual, virtually research a college, we can give you some smart tips on how to do that in a very mindful kind of way. So again, um, be sure if you're interested in more services to um, book a consultation with us and attend our future webinars. One of them is coming up next week. And that, that page can be, um, can be found right here. Post College Prep in a Coast post-COVID world is coming up soon, um, as well as our webinars on essays and applying to UTA. So I'm going to stop share right now. I am looking and I don't see any further questions for either of us. So um, uh, if anyone else has any comments, please type them in and um, we will hopefully hear from all of you soon. Big shout out to all of our scholars who came out today and all of the folks that are new to us. So glad that you're here. All right, I guess it's time to end for tonight. So um, everyone have a great evening. Thanks so much for spending just an hour of it with us. We're so very pleased that you were here. Have a great evening and we hope to see you all soon, okay?